Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us Jude Kempfner, who is the founder of Jude Creativity Coaching. Jude, welcome to the program. Hi, Mike. Um, I'm really impressed by the range of speakers that you have, the range of experts and topics. It's fantastic. Well, thank you. I um, I find that it's I've got this really high um, level method of contacting really well known people, and I'm going to share it with you right now. And and you might want to write it down because many people don't know this technique. It's called asking. <laughs> and I, I say that really funny because so many times people say, well, how did you get whoever, right? Tom Hopkins or Eric Quammen or Bob Berg or, or whoever else, you know, and I'm going, I sent them a LinkedIn message and I said, wow, I loved your book. I've read it twice. Can I interview you on my podcast? Do you have time for a 20-minute phone interview? So it really is interesting that it, it's um, it, whatever we want in business, in life, sometimes it's just a matter of, putting it out there and ask. So thank you for noticing. But give us a little bit of background on yourself. What is your professional background and what led you to start your coaching firm? Well, I think talking actually um, is quite key. The way I was educated, um, I went to Cambridge University in the UK where the method of teaching was kind of pretty arcane. Um, it was called, you went to supervisions, which is a funny way because actually you were entirely unsupervised. Um, you were given a list of about 15 books and an essay title each week, and then you wrote the essay on your own in the libraries, and you showed up into this uh, lecturer's room. He was called, a, or she was called a don. You read your essay, and during the essay, he or she would try to unnerve you by scowling or picking their nose or um, just like looking away. And um, when you finish, there's usually silence and you thought, oh my goodness. And then there was a battery of questions. And the general indication was that you were wrong and you had to prove yourself right. So it was largely a kind of gamesmanship um, and you had to fight hard to justify your position. So I... I found I really enjoyed this. I found it was actually kind of lazy way of learning. You didn't have to go to any lectures. No lectures were compulsory. So what I do would be I would do the reading, skim read, write all night um, doing the essay before the supervision. And when the supervision was over and I got my new topic, I put it away. I would go to, to the market, which was in the lovely square in Cambridge, buy some nice food, um, eat uh, sleep and then play for about three days and then start again. What yeah. it meant was you got used to deadline writing, you got used to self-discipline, you got used to defending your position, engaging in fast-paced talk, and adjusting your answers to the questions that were fired at you. So in a way, I felt like, well, the subject I was reading, as they called it, was history, because really only do one subject. Um, but the the topic was actually irrelevant. It was the teaching method that gave me the education. Yeah, I think we could probably spend a four-hour episode on just that that introduction right there, and I'll point out a couple things that I um, noticed. Number one is so many times kids. You know, I've got four kids, and they're in, one's still in high school, and three are in or two are in college, and one's graduated. But you hear complaints. Uh, when are we ever going to use algebra? In when, Why do we need to learn this? Well, you know what? I will admit that there are some topics in school that we learn and have to take the classes that we'll never need to learn, uh, use in life again. But guess what? I agree with what you just said. It's the process of going through it. It's the discipline of learning that new topic. It's having your mental brain neurons firing to to bring in new synapses or or learning that new information and it's the discipline so i think that's huge 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 another thing is i thought it was really right. interesting you said writing on a deadline and you know skimming and then and then and then being it's almost like impromptu acting well i think that it's really curious that if you know your content 
you don't really need, and maybe if there's speech coaches out there right now hearing this, they would cringe, but when I, I am extremely good in front of a group or doing live webinars, things like that, but I do not stand in front of a mirror and practice over and over. I just know my stuff and I talk. And so I think that that's the example you were giving there is, you know, you, you skim the material and then you're really on point and focused to defend it. So that was really a couple of, of big zingers there. I really appreciate that. That's great because actually um, what, you, what you learn is you absorb a lot of information. You um, extract what you, what you need from it. Um, unfortunately, you tend to forget the information. Well, I do. I think I've got that kind of brain. Um, but it's helped a lot when I've done all my radio work and all the interviews and all the projects and all the topics because I can research them very, very intensively. But then if somebody says to me, like, two years later, what was that program about? I can only give them a few sentences. But it doesn't yeah. actually matter. Um, what matters yeah. is that you're there and present at the time. A hundred percent. So now what, with that lead in, what led you to start your coaching firm and then what type of clients do you work with? Well, I started in radio. Um, that was my career um, for years and um, did all kinds of, of radio um, from like basketball commentary to science to current affairs and to the arts. And um, I felt like I got so far in that I'd won lots of awards. I could pull rabbits out of hats. I could, um, you know, if there were problems, I could always present solutions. All the programs got made. Um, I had my own company that was working for the BBC, was registered as one of their suppliers. And when you get to that stage, basically you make the whole program. You, um, there's a long pitching process, but once they give you the thumbs up after the pitch, it's all yours. You get the budget. They never listen to it. It goes to air, and then you start again. Um, so it's a pretty grueling process, but you learn a lot, you meet a lot of people, you cover a lot of topics. Um, and I felt like I had, it wasn't that I was burnt out, but that I had come to a real sense of like fulfillment and I wanted a break and I wanted to do something else. Um, and what I did was I just, I wrote a letter one, one night at 4 a.m. to friends and family and I thought, I want to be public about this. And I said, I hereby say I'm going to quit radio and I don't know what else I'm going to do. Uh, but be sure that it will be something interesting. And I was surprised that within a few hours I got messages saying, go for it, girl. Like, you know, we know that it's going to be great. And at first, after a few days, I thought, I know, I'd like to coach freelancers because a lot of my radio career has been freelancing. There are a lot of pitfalls. Really, you have to be in it for the long haul, and there's a lot that I can share. So I went to NYU and did a couple of coaching courses. Found that they were very much geared to business. They were very much about models and algorithms. And this didn't seem to be my kind of coaching, so I was still searching and did a lot of reading. And I found a man called Eric Maisel who says he's invented creativity coaching in San Francisco. I loved what he wrote. I did some courses with him. And then I started taking on clients. And I found that my radio work, the interviewing, uh, was great. I could kind of um, learn where the person was coming from, what their style was, what their knowledge base was, and help them from there. And um, because basically I think most of my favorite work in radio was in the arts. I was really, really happy to have artists as my clients. Um, and they come at things from a different way and they're often very personal and I love that. They're often very vulnerable. I could feel I was really of service. And one of the great things that I've discovered is that a lot of people are from a radio background like me, so we mutually have an understanding. But they say, you know what, I've got this passion project. Over the years, I've been collecting the tape about X. Usually it's some kind of family story. Uh, but I've been working on deadlines for other clients all my life, but I'd like to make this story. I'd like to make a long-form podcast using my tape 
and I'm in the weeds. I'm, it, I'm too close to it. I want to stand back. Can you help me do it? And so that's sort of been a, a niche that it's become, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Well, and I think that that's interesting when you say in the weeds and step back, because uh, I, I'm familiar with, uh, and you've probably heard this too, you can't see the forest for the trees. It means you're inside the forest and you're just, you're, you're too close to it. So when someone from the outside in England, we say looks wood in, for the trees. yeah, 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 yeah. So that's, that's exactly the same thing. So you, as yeah. someone outside of that, you know, artist you're talking to, you can see things, sense things, and and even predict things that they can do based on what uh, what they were talking about. I literally yesterday had a call with someone, uh, and and they were just all over the place. And at, by the end of the call, I said, okay, so it sounds like, and we just, cl- and it was almost like the light switch went on, and we just clarified it. Well. When someone comes to someone like yourself, like a, uh, for a media coach, and can say, I've got something in me, I've got this passion project, and I know I want to go to media, whatever that media may look like, now you can help guide them and clarify it so that they can then take that platform and move forward, whereas they might be paralyzed and stuck currently. Absolutely. And because it's a personal thing, they're often very sensitive about it. And I often find that we're dancing around it for quite a few sessions. Like I had a session this morning with a woman who was brought up in a Mennonite community uh, in the 70s. And um, she was writing a novel. And she didn't really want to talk about it in the novel. But obviously a lot of the issues concerned it. So gently, gently I was pushing her to bring some of the precepts that she was given, uh, some of the teachings, and, um, and then finally she kind of head on started to describe what it was like growing up there and how it had very much influenced her life. And now we've moved from it being fictional to being non-fictional, which mm-hmm. I think, think will be much more attractive to listeners. Well, definitely get her in a good position to for me t- to take her to a big production house because I think that's an area that people are fascinated by she's not approaching it as a cult she's approaching it as something she loved and understood um, but uh, like has looked back on with fondness but moved away from you know um, the the person I mentioned that I was speaking with yesterday spent 30 plus years in the military, currently works for Homeland Security, and is getting ready in three months to retire and wants to now launch into speaking and coaching. And she made a comment that, you know, for so long, she's thought, when I get out of the military, I am done. It's just, I'm moving on. I'm going to wash my hands of it. And I, and then she kept thinking and coming back and, and, and getting drawn back in because it becomes so much part of you. I've never been in the military myself, but I can understand what she means by that because now she says, you know, maybe I'm going to take what I'm going to be coaching clients on and tie in my fabric and foundation of the military. And now that makes it much more powerful than trying to forget the past or move on. It's part of you. Why fight it? So I think that's a really big observation when you can bring that to someone's attention. And can I say something there, Mike? Like, that person would maybe, if they came to me and they said, I want to do some paintings about that experience, or some poetry, or even a podcast, slowly we would get to some um, points in uh, the career that were things that she didn't want to remember. Yeah. You know? And bring and draw them out. Yeah, and, and and now we're getting into psychology, I'm sure, but and if you draw them out and address them, maybe they're not as big and nasty and bad as your memory serves, and you can kind of let that move past in your memory because it's like, well, yeah, that wasn't a, a fun situation, but yeah, now that I think about it, it wasn't all that bad, so okay, I can move on. And, and maybe there becomes a life lesson or a professional lesson you can learn from that, but yet it was down in your memory kind of like n- nagging at you you and it, it just was something that was negative but but now you can use it in a positive way definitely and I definitely think there's some sort of therapeutic and cathartic, sure. cathartic use for um, 
doing something artistic. I'm, I don't want to go into therapy. That's not my background. I think that would be really dangerous. A couple of times people have said, um, this is unnerving for me. And I said, like, go away and um, think it through. And we can um, bring it down quite a few notches and we can rework it a different way. Um, we don't have to, to take it into the darkest areas. Yes, exactly. So let's talk about your practice. If you, um, if you were to kind of summarize it up into exactly what you can do for a client, what is it that they could expect results-wise? I think if a client particularly wants to make a podcast, um, I can definitely help, partic particularly if they want to make a podcast that has this sort of long-form, sound-rich, well-researched, outlined sort of format um, because that draws in all the expertise of my radio background. But I can also help people that want to do an artistic pursuit or move from one art form to another. Um, a poet who wants to be a novelist, a games designer who wants to use the, the experience of sound in games to go into audio installations, that sort of thing, or anyone in the, in the arts um, who feels stuck, who has uh, problems with dealing with rejection, which happens all the time, with criticism, you know, critics can really hurt you, um, or who just wants to um, find new ways of being inspired. And taking that and clarifying it for them, but then giving them one additional powerful step, which is now here's what you can do with it. It might be this type of media platform or that type of media platform and teaching them what can be done to then build their brand so that they're, you know, maybe almost if you take it to the fullest extreme, you know, you're now helping them to build out their legacy. Exactly. And I think a lot of people don't think big enough. Like my company called Corporation for Independent Media, the radio company, which was like way kind of like highfalutin, um, uh, considering I'm five foot one, <laughs> and it, it's basically a solopreneur's business. But I think that's very important to think big. I also think like with podcasting, you have to think big business now because that's the way it's going. And whatever your project, you have to think of your avatar. You have to think of um, how, how uh, what bigger market you're aiming at um, and what kind of podcast producing company you're going to go to, what kind of advertisers you think will be drawn to your work. I don't think you can ignore those things, but you can still keep your vision. Yes, a hundred percent. And I, and I love that you focus on the creatives and the artists and uh, because I think that becomes a very tight uh, niche that will help ident you know if you just said I can help anyone who is stuck and well now you're you're not talking to anybody because you're trying to talk to everybody so I like your focus there and that really mm -hmm. helps you dial in um, benefit statements and target audience so I just think it's a really neat uh, opportunity to take your industry experience that you've had uh, for for so long and then now to help people coming behind you to guide them you know and and they're the they're the hero, you're the guide, and everybody wins. And I think if you come from the arts, you can sometimes be a little bit too precious. Like I was talking to somebody yesterday, and I was, uh, I was saying, you know, they're really going to want a celebrity to voice this. And she was like, um, no, absolutely not. Celebrities would, like, spoil it. Everything is celebrity-based. Yeah. And I said, but you've got to just accept reality. If that's what the client wants, that's what we've got to give them. You know, and if you say no, you're really like um, setting your chances back. You know, that's interesting because um, influencer marketing is such a big, big uh, term these days. And I think that um, being able to determine if you can, if influencer marketing is a possibility for you, um, then that's a whole whole world. But I, I interviewed someone uh, on my podcast this week, um, Amanda Russell, and she um, is 
uh, specializes in influencer marketing. In fact, she's got a big um, uh, book launch coming out next week, and the launch party is hosted by Sir Andy Roddick, and it's going to be really interesting because um, her book is on influence and influencer marketing. But the the point that she was making is, it sometimes it an, a celebrity is not the right choice. And sometimes they are. And it's just like anything. Should every single entrepreneur use email marketing, Facebook marketing? And, and you're going to have cases where you don't have the right audience for that particular medium. And you need to have that expert guiding you to, to show you which would be better and why so that you understand it. But yeah, there is. Facebook marketing might work wonderfully for someone else, but horribly for me. So I think that that's what we need to know about ourselves, our target audience, our services. And when someone like yourself can come alongside of that client and guide them, I think that's what just really helps that momentum and uh, um, they, they get unstuck. And that client if I can really help them, is making their work for another client, right? Just like the BBC for years was my client. And, you know, if something has to be 23 minutes and 30 seconds, that's what it's got to be, right? Yeah. And, you've, and each, each slot had its own style. Um, it's, you know, and you had to listen and you had to do everything by the book, all the paperwork. You have to be an artist with a sense of discipline and a sense of knowing that um, you're in a you're a cog in a greater wheel. Well, Jude, I, I think it's really neat to be able to talk with someone with such vast industry experience. So, thank you for coming on. What's the best way that someone can reach out and connect with you and learn more about your uh, packages and services? Uh, if you go to my website, Jude Kampfner, K A M P F N E R dot com. Um, there'll be everything to click on to there. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.